Hello, everyone. Um, good evening. Good afternoon again to those on the West Coast. My name is Eric Story. I hope everybody is uh, surviving this uh, so-called heat dome that's kind of affecting everywhere. It seems every corner of Canada, but especially those on the West Coast and on the prairies. I hope you're keeping as cool as you possibly can. But for those who don't know, I'm the outreach manager at the Laurier Centre for Military Strategic and Disarmament Studies in Waterloo, Ontario. Now I and the rest of the folks at the Laurier Military Centre, as well as our partners for this evening, the Canadian Battlefields Foundation, the Juno Beach Centre Association, and the Gregg Centre for the Study of War and Society, would like to welcome you all to the fourth installment of the Maple Leaf Route webinar series. But before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the extensive history of the land in which the Laurier Military Centre resides. Our office is located on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Neutral Peoples. In 1701, this land fell under the Dish with One Spoon Treaty between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples, a treaty that was part of the Great Peace of Montreal in the same year that marked the end of the Beaver Wars of the 17th century. It represented and continues to represent today an eternal agreement to not only share and protect resources, but also solve conflicts peacefully. Eighty-some years later, in 1784, the Haldimand Proclamation was signed between the Haudenosaunee and the British Crown following the American Revolution, and the Haudenosaunee were given a tract of land that extended six miles on either side of the Grand River from its source just north of Orangeville today to Lake Erie. Today, this treaty territory remains the homeland of Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee communities and the home to many Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island and acknowledging their presence in the past and present reminds everyone of the responsibilities we all hold as treaty people. Now, to those who have been tuning in from the beginning, this may sound familiar, um, but for those who, are, who haven't been to one of our webinars yet along the Maple Leaf Route, you might be wondering what exactly is this Maple Leaf Route webinar series and what exactly we're doing here. Well, since May and until September, We've been, uh, we've been and, and will be following the Canadians through the battles of Normandy in 1944, from the D-Day beaches, which we looked at in May, through the capture of Caen in July, and eventually the fighting towards Falaise in August. Now the cost of this fighting, it was enormous. From the 6th of June to the 23rd of August, 1944, over 5,000 Canadian service people lost their lives. And any visitor to the war cemeteries in Normandy cannot help but be moved by such losses. Now our nine part series, the fourth of which taking place tonight, features a range of historians asking a range of historical questions. Some of these questions will be tactical and these will largely be asked tonight and, and answered as well. Others will consider the little known role of Canadian women on the battlefield, which we looked at two weeks ago, and others yet will explore the importance of morale and the puzzle of psychological stress, which will come in the weeks ahead. All of our speakers, however, will reflect in some way on the ever-changing ways we remember the Canadians in the battles of Normandy. Now, if after tonight's event and even throughout the series, you feel you have learned something of value, please consider donating to the Canadian Battlefields Foundation and the Juno Beach Center Association. During these difficult pandemic times, your donations will keep future tours alive and ensure that the Canadian contributions to the Second World War will not be forgotten. This month, the Juno Beach Center Association is participating in the Great Canadian Giving Challenge. For every dollar you donate, you will be giving the Juno Beach Center a chance to win $20,000 to continue, to continue their mission of commemorating the legacy of our veterans. And if you donate $500, you will automatically receive a Canadian flag to be flown at the Juno Beach Centre in Normandy to commemorate the sacrifices of Canadian soldiers during the Second World War. But I would like to remind folks that today is the last day to donate to the gate for the Great Canadian Giving Challenge to the Juno Beach Centre. So if you do want to donate, please do so before midnight. And you can donate to both the Juno Beach Centre Association and the Canadian Battlefields Foundation by going to our website at canadianmilitaryhistory.ca forward slash webinar and clicking donate at the top of the page. I'll say that one more time and I'll make sure to share it with you at the bottom of your screen in the chat function. 
It's canadianmilitaryhistory.ca forward slash webinar. Now, normally I would turn it over to Dr. Jeff Hayes, my co-host to provide a few remarks about the Canadian Battlefields Foundation, but since he's not able to join us tonight, I'm sorry, but I will just have to do. The Canadian Battlefields Foundation was the brainchild of a group of determined veterans and academics who were concerned in the early 90s that the Canadian role in the battles of Normandy might be forgotten. The foundation and the Juno Beach Center have worked to ensure that the Canadian role in the campaign remains fresh in the minds of Europeans as well as Canadians. And since the 6th of June 2003, official ceremonies at the Juno Beach Center have brought together French, European and Canadian participants to reflect and remember. And every year since 2003, the foundation organizes three commemorative ceremonies on the 7th of June. At the Canadian Memorial Garden on the grounds of Le Memorial des Camps, at the Place de l'Ancien Boucherie in Caen, and finally in the Garden of the Abbey des Ardennes, where Canadian soldiers were brutally murdered, murdered in June of 1944. Since 1996, the foundation has also brought together an array of remarkable young men and women from all parts of our country to tour and learn about the battlefields. They have included Indigenous peoples, the grandchildren of veterans serving members of the Canadian Armed Forces, as well as future teachers, academics, and decision makers. And we will actually hear from one of these alumni in just a minute tonight. This is the second year that the Canadian Battlefields Foundation has been unable to organize a student tour. And as such, the Foundation President, General Mark Lassard, agreed that a virtual tour drawing on a distinguished panel of academics would offer a chance for a wider audience to see the Foundation's mandate in practice. So if you will, imagine yourself on the battlefields of Normandy with some of the best guides to inform you. Now, some of you might um, have some trouble with the immersive experience if you're seeing that closed captioning popping up at the bottom of your screen. But what you can do actually is click that CC button again at the bottom of your window and you can toggle closed captioning on and off if you find it distracting. But now I would like to turn it over to Brandy Smythe, a CBF alum from 2003, to introduce our speaker this evening and briefly tell us how her CBF tour experience has impacted her. Thanks, Eric. I'm really honored to be here this evening to introduce uh, Lee Windsor to you guys. And uh, being here is, is really like coming home for me. As an undergraduate and graduate student, I worked for the Laurier Military Center for a number of years. I was also privileged to be chosen as one of 10 students to participate in the Canadian Battlefield Foundation's only full tour of Canadian battlefields in Italy in 2003, a whopping 18 years ago. I was then selected to work as a guide at the Canadian Memorial Garden in Le Memorial in Caen at, uh, in 2004 and was proud to be a representative of the foundation in Normandy for the 60th anniversary of D-Day. It is thanks to the Canadian Battlefields Foundation that I had two of the most amazing experiences of my life and I will be forever grateful. As an undergraduate student at Laurier, I studied military history under Terry Kopp and Mike Bechtold and learned the importance of studying military history from the ground up. This lesson was fully apparent to me on my battlefield tour as I presented on the Allied landings uh, in mainland Italy at Salerno. I was a naive undergraduate who had done my research, but didn't realize until I stood on the ground just how far away the mountain objectives really were. I would never fully have understood the challenges Canadian soldiers faced in Sicily and Italy, at Mount Osoro in Ortona, or the strategic importance of the monastery at Monte Cassino, to name only a few, had I not walked the ground for myself. Traveling through Italy, studying the Canadian battlefields with the foundation changed my life and the course of my studies, and it influenced all of my graduate research. My tour also introduced me to some amazing people, and I formed friendships that almost 20 years later are still strong. Lee Windsor was one of the people I met on my tour as he was one of our guides before he was Dr. Windsor and his Italian was still pretty rough. Uh, he has taught me so much over the years and I am very honored to be here tonight to introduce you to my friend, Dr. Lee Windsor. He is an associate professor of history and holds the Frederick S. Eaton chair 
in Canadian Army Studies at the University of New Brunswick's Gregg Center for the Study of War and Society. He studied under Terry Kopp for his MA and drove him and his wife, Linda, during the first experimental CBF tour in 1995. His publications include Kandahar Tour with, Dr. with David Charters and Brent Wilson, Steel Cavalry, and Loyal Gunners with Roger Sardi and Mark Milner. Without further ado, I present to you Lee Windsor. Thanks, Brandy. The Furnace, Smythe. It's, uh, it's been good to see you again as we've been prepping for this in the last couple of days. Thanks very much uh, to Eric for organizing this webinar series and to Jeff as well for the invitation, the opportunity. And as you probably gotten the impression from, from Brandy, I'm an Italian campaign guy. So what's an Italian campaign guy doing talking about point 67 and the Battle of Normandy? Well, and it is a good question. And, and uh, I guess one that I've been thinking about for a long time, uh, over, over 26 years, more like 30 years since I was a young soldier myself. Uh, and in the interest of full disclosure, uh, some of you out there already know this, but I am, I, I learned my Jedi history ways, wielding my historical lightsaber, uh, studying under the Terry Yoda, as we call him, as some of us call him, uh, back in, at my, for my master's degree in Wilfrid Laurier University. And later, the, the second speaker in this series, Professor Mark Milner, uh, was my PhD supervisor at the University of New Brunswick and my longtime friend and colleague here at the Gregg Center for the Study of War and Society, where we've worked together for many years uh, and still work together, even in, in his retirement. He's still uh, still out there cracking around, as you as you clearly saw a few weeks ago. So I first got the chance to go to Normandy with Terry while I was still a serving member of the Canadian Armed Forces. And at the time I went uh, to, as part of my uh, professional military education, thinking that it was going to support my military career. Uh, but it was, the experience arguably helped uh, make me rethink my, my future and part of a few other things going on in the, in the former Yugoslavia in that terrible decade uh, in the mid 1990s and other places of the world uh, made me decide that the place for me in my career path was uh, to speak on behalf of soldiers outside the chain of command. So I left the army to pursue my PhD back in New Brunswick, went home to my native province, my home province. And here I sit still, I haven't left uh, since coming home. But back in 1995, when this was all still in doubt, uh, I was first introduced to the CBF when it was still fresh. Uh, and I got to, got to visit, in, uh, in, and I'll speak more about that first trip in 1995 in a few moments, because it, uh, I think it was really foundational to why we're here talking about a place called Point 67. And that's what Jeff asked me to speak to today, um, and, and those parts of the campaign in Normandy that are really visible from Point 67. And, and this, this physical piece of the landscape in Normandy might not mean anything to a lot of you, uh, but I know some of you out there listening tonight are alumni. I know some, some of my former friends, or not former friends, some of my friends that we've met along the way uh, have reached out to say hello. So I know you're out there and I know you know what Point 67 is all about, but some of you presumably are, um, this is your first foray. This is your first experience uh, with that location and what's possible to do from it. And I guess that's what I'm interested in mostly tonight. I'm interested in the story, in the military history story of what happens there and the debate about what happens there and in, the, in parts uh, south of there. But as an educator now myself, teaching at the University of New Brunswick at the Gregg Center for the Study of War and Society, I'm as much interested in how we can use it to understand the past, especially at a time when Canadian history is in a tremendous state of flux and change, as history always is, uh, as we are all getting ready to figure out a new way to, to honor Canada Day tomorrow uh, with orange shirts and, and learning more about the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission findings. Uh, this is an important day to consider who gets to choose which events are important in Canadian history. And uh, so I want to talk to you about what's important about Point 67 so we can have a conversation about what, how that compares to other events in Canadian history, including D-Day uh, that Terry spoke to you about first in the series, and including the battle for the bridgehead 
that Mark was speaking to you about in his stopping the Panzers uh, presentation to you a few weeks ago and the wider Canadian role in the Battle of Normandy on a, on a, on a more strategic level. Um, but I would suggest to you that we can't really have a conversation about what matters about 0.67 until you go there, until you see it. And we can't do that until the restrictions lift a little bit further after everybody gets their vaccinations, but we could just have a simple flyover. So if you'll bear with me, I'm going to share my screen and we're going to have a little video ride uh, over to 0.67. Bear with me just one minute. for the first four weeks of the operation, but all of the badges of the other, there's five times more Canadians involved in the Normandy campaign than the ones that we've been looking at over the previous two days. All Hayden says they're all. So what else do you do? Okay, what'd you think of that? I'm going to stop sharing this for a minute so I can see you for a moment. I just want to say a, a, a quick word about where that video came from. It was taken in 2018 with our Greg Center War in the Canadian Experience uh, Teachers Professional Development Program and Field School. And I'll say a few more words about how that came to be in a moment because it's really an outgrowth of the Canadian Battlefields Foundation program that Terry began in, in 1995. Uh, but I want to speak a little bit to, uh, the, the video was taken by Trip Lewis, put together by Trip Lewis. He had a, a, a 5G gyro stabilized camera, kind of like the, a tank main gun uh, on a pole. And he was walking around following the group after they dispersed from our vans to do a site interrogation. I'll talk more about that in a moment too. But what's really impressive about, about the video is it starts out, those of you who have been to Point 67 before will know this, uh, but for those of you who haven't, it starts out on the west side of the high feature where you can get a, a view back looking north all the way to Caen. Uh, you can see out uh, to the west towards Hill 112 and the, the British, uh, British area of responsibility, the British uh, uh, Second Army. And then you can see south to May sur Orne and you can see the water tower at Fontenay sur Le Marion. You can see Verrier Ridge very clearly. Uh, and you can see the commanding perspective that Point 67 offers, both from a military sense in 1944 and from an educational perspective as a vantage point to see lots of the earth. And that's ultimately why we go there. Um, and let me share my screen again to, to share a few photographs with you about why we think this place matters. Uh, this still shot taken from that same video uh, gives you that view uh, to the south. And you can see, hopefully, 
uh, well, in the very center of the screen, you can see a, a something clearly man-made on the far horizon that is the water tower at Fontenelle Marmion, that objective of the Black Watch uh, during Operation Spring in late July of 1944. You can see the towns of Aceron that have blended in with the other neighboring villages at St. Andre uh, spread out behind my head. Uh, and then you can see very a ridge extending off uh, to the left of your screen. And the, 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 ab, the power and command of this location, photographs can never do the ground justice, right? But I have to say, after 26 years of visiting battlefields and studying them all across uh, Europe, this is, a and being an Italian campaign guy and being familiar with stands on top of mountains where you can really get a, a perspective on uh, tens of miles and 20, you know, hundreds of miles in some cases, uh, literally hundreds of miles in some cases of landscape. Um, this one is, is as close as I've ever been in Northwest Europe to something that reminds me of Italy. And this is one of the reasons that the Canadian Battlefields Foundation chose to make this into a, not just a memorial site, but a learning site, a, Belv a Belvedere in which people could come to understand the Battle of Normandy and Canada's role in it. And not just Canada's role, but its role within the wider alliance context. Uh, so uh, for those of you who haven't had the advantage of being there, I'm going to show you a couple of maps to situate these visuals that you've got uh, to the ground, to the landscape. Uh, the blue arrows, which I tried to come as close as I could to a, a second division blue, are pointing at point 67 in the center lower part of your screen just a little bit south of fleury sur and a little bit west of Is and due north of St. Andre. It's a central feature in Canada's role in Operation Atlantic. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with Operation Goodwood, the great tank thrust to break south from Caen or supposedly break south from Caen. That's one of the things we wanna talk about tonight are the various competing perspectives about what allied intentions are uh, in this series of actions and how history has judged them. So this gives you a sense of where point 67 fits in the closeout for the battle for Caen in, the, in July and mid July and late July of 1944. And that first thrust on to, to capture this just tremendously powerful point of real estate that secures the approaches to, or that secures Caen, secures Caen as a, as a place that can be turned into a base as a headquarters, as a place to take care of refugees and all of the things uh, that can be done once there is security by controlling the high ground south of the town. This image, uh, one of Mike Bechtold's maps, um, gives you a sense of point 67 more to how it relates to Verrier Ridge to the south in this sketch map of how it pertains to Operation Spring, the highly controversial Canadian action on the 25th of July. And I'm sure there are lots of people here with lots of questions and lots of, and maybe angry questions. If there's ever a battle in Normandy that elicits angry questions, it's this one, not least of which about the, 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 the destruction, the virtual destruction of the Black Watch uh, on the 25th of July in that action. But from point 67, you can see more that before spring, there was the, the pre-spring, there was the destruction or virtual destruction of the, Saskat the South Saskatchewan Regiment and the Essex Scottish. Mm -hmm that uh, from, from Windsor and Chatham, Ontario, that elicits all kinds of angry sentiment. Uh, and we can talk more about that too. And then this, the arrow there is pointing at that bend in the road between Fleury and St. Andre at which point 67 is located. It gives you a sense of how this is really a base area and launch point for Operation Totalize. Yet another highly controversial uh, component of Canada's Normandy campaign. There's nothing but controversy. There's little consensus. And some of the debate between historians can at times be nasty. Uh, although I should temper that comment to some degree by suggesting that it, it has been nasty. I think we are reaching consensus uh, that arguably the Canadian army in the Battle of Normandy did, re did reasonably well. It did the best it probably could. And ultimately, it won the war. And perhaps it's time to move on to a new set of questions uh, about the Battle of Normandy. However, we have to balance that, per, that uh, assessment based on what 
professional military historians are talking about, but the fact that so many critical perspectives on Canada, the Canadian Army's performance in those operations between Caen and Falaise in July and August 1944, that paradigm remains so dominant, or it had dominated the landscape for so long, it had become virtually the gospel. And once it is written, it remains very difficult uh, to undo. And I recall one time we were flying back from an LC, uh, LCMDS SDS, uh, tour with Terry back around 2003 or four. And we were quite satisfied, satisfied with ourselves that the group that we had brought with us was had been introduced to the alternative perspective of, of, a, of a reasonable level of Canadian success, not a, not a, a rose colored glasses kind of perspective, but, a, but a, a perhaps a balanced one. And they were gonna go home better informed. And I remember Terry saying, we're changing the paradigm. And we are, we have, we were, we did, but it's not fully changed yet. And I'm sure this statement is that and we'll, we'll see this turn up in the, in the Q and a conversation. Uh, and I, what I want to do tonight is, is differ from Terry and Mark's approach and uh, from Sarah's perhaps a little bit too, and try to drop some, some bombs into the, to, into the crowd and get conversation going so we can deal with this more as a question and answer session, as a conversation and discussion, as opposed to me talking at you. And that very much reflects the approach of our Greg Center War and the Canadian Experience team. So I'm speaking here on behalf of, or as myself, as Lee Windsor from the Greg Center, but really what I wanna to talk to you about is the approach we take to this piece of ground, this part of the story, how it connects to all Canadian military history and, Canadian, and, and international history writ large. And that's an approach that I don't, uh, have not developed on my own. It's, a, it's very much a collaborative process uh, and a collaborative approach done, worked on with Blake Seward, you see on the left and Dr. Cindy Brown, and uh, Blake's son, Ben, who's uh, kind of a, who's much our adopted son as anyone else. Some of you may know of Blake. He's a, an award-winning teacher from Smith Falls, Ontario, a founder of the Lest We, the founder of the Lest We Forget program. Dr. Cindy Brown is the executive director of the Greg Center here. And Ben is, uh, ben is at a point in his career where he is at, at, he's in a post-secondary training world and we expect him to move on to great things, but he's still a, an essential member of our team. Um, the question we want to, we all ask when we go to point 67 is why Juneau Beach gets all the visitors and all the popular airtime compared to events south of Kong, especially when you consider that most of what, well, but all of what occurs from Juneau Beach to Kong is about 3rd Canadian Division and 2nd Canadian Armoured Brigade. And it's important. It's significant. No question. Uh, it's the start of the campaign, and, and, and the start of the campaign on D-Day has a lot of preamble that goes with it, and you've heard a lot about that in the last three sessions. However, the, the reality is that after Caen, we see the injection of 2nd Canadian Division. We see the activation of 2nd Canadian head, Corps Headquarters under General Simmons. We see the addition of 2nd Canadian Army Group Royal Artillery, which is a de facto artillery division uh, that comes out of great war experience and gets integrated into the Canadian Army and comes out of the British Army system and is very integral to the way the Canadian Army fights in Italy as well as the way it fights in Normandy. And then on top of that we get 4th Canadian Armoured Division and then the activation of 1st Canadian Army and all its, its troops, 1st Canadian Army troops, extra supporting logist logisticians, engineers, uh, gunners, survey troops, uh, and base support troops, line of communications troops that enable an army to move, an army that is a city, a complete city that can pack up into vehicles and move significant distances in short amounts of time. All of that capability comes ashore after D-Day, long after D-Day, and it, and it becomes activated for the actions that we've just mentioned above, particularly for Operation Totalize uh, in August of 1944. And that becomes the largest Canadian Army operation in history up to that point. And it's not just a Canadian operation. It is also a multinational coalition operation, including 51st Highland Division and the and 1st Polish Armour Division. Uh, and that in itself is, is arguably rather significant, given that 51st Highland Division coming from the West Isles and Highlands of, of Scotland uh, is a traditional Canadian combat partner in both world wars. 
fought alongside the Canadian Expeditionary Force, the Canadian Corps in, at Vimy and in the 100 Days Campaign. It fought alongside Newfoundlanders at Beaumont Hamill, as for those of you who have been there know. It fought alongside Canadians in Sicily. And once again, it's part of First Canadian Army in Normandy. Is that not significant? The integration of, of First Polish Army Division is, is also pretty powerful, given that so many of those Poles can't go home after the war, and many of them will wind up settling in Canada. This, this, my mother's side of the family is half Polish, so it's a matter of particular concern to me. Um, and, and I think to myself now, but if, if we're looking at, at continuity and change questions about why the past matters to the way we do business now, currently the Canadian Army uh, contingent serving in Latvia serves alongside uh, Pol Polish troops and coalition operations in which we see Canadians led by and Canadians leading uh, allied troops from NATO nations and other UN partners on NATO and UN missions around the world. Arguably, this is the start of something very powerful. It's the start, uh, and we, we see it also in Italy. It's a, it's a subject uh, that I've examined quite extensively and I'm working on for a new book project on how this multinational coalition warfare looks in Italy. But back to point 67 and, and its comparison to D-Day and the earliest, the, the first three, four weeks of the Battle of Normandy, if, when we look at the, the death that occurs after Caen, it's, it's, it's incomparable. Uh, the, the cemetery photograph that you see in your screen now at Bretto Sarlais doesn't get visited near as much as the one at Beni sur Mer, where you see 2,000 Canadians at Beni sur Mer. We've got uh, nearly 3,000 at Bretville. Uh, but it's worth remembering that many of the 2,000 that are at uh, Beni also include burials um, from the actions south of Caen. And then that doesn't include the hospital cemetery at Bayeux, where we've got another batch of five or 600 Canadians, and then there's others scattered here and there. Uh, so the sheer amount of loss, and one of the questions we often ask students when we bring them here and, and, and teachers when we bring them to this space, is how do, how do you measure significance? Does the Canadian loss of life in any particular event uh, make, an, is that a reason uh, to justify why it's significant in Canadian history? It's a good question to ask and we'll get back to it. Um, as part of our perspective and as part of the perspective of the Canadian Battlefields Foundation as a whole, veterans' perspectives matter. Uh, Terry cut his teeth interviewing veterans when he was working with Bob Bogle on the Maple Leaf Root Series, and he passed that spirit on to all of us who worked with him. Not everyone, younger people today, obviously don't have that opportunity nearly as much. I had the good fortune, uh, and Blake and Cindy have had the good fortune uh, we started out this, this program when a number of veterans were still alive. And veterans from every rank level, arguably the generals get lots of attention, and perhaps even the privates who suffer get lots of attention. One of the rank levels that matters most to me in this is the middle management, uh, particularly company and squadron commanders, officers at the captain and major level, and their sergeants major, and platoon leaders, and platoon second in commands, and platoon sergeants, and platoon warrants, as we call them now. The kind of people who get the job done and have to make the tough decisions at the pointy end of the spear and whose stories are so numerous that it's hard to tell them all. Uh, but nonetheless, Terry in his time was influenced by a number of these people. So was Mark, all of us by family members. And myself in particular, I was influenced by a guy who was involved in the photograph you see uh, in front of you in uh, moving up to Verrier Ridge. Uh, John Edmondson, major at the time of Operation Atlantic and later Lieutenant Colonel and the commanding officer of the South Saskatchewan Regiment, had the great honor of going to Normandy with him in 2004 on a, on a Laurier tour that we ran, that I ran with uh, Mike Bechtold. And John came along with his son and gave us his perspective on the historian's judgment of how things went down between the 22nd of July and the 25th of July. And it altered my universe. Uh, spent two intense weeks with John, picking his brain at every turn. And uh, one of the results of that experience was that he published his, uh, his, his, his memories of the war a, as a journal article in the Canadian Military History Journal. So if you're interested, check it out. Uh, and I know, Lauren, you're out there. You remember uh, John well. He was a big, tall guy and a powerful guy and had a lot to say about not everything that happened between Khan and Falaise uh, and especially 
the things that happened on Varia Ridge uh, round one and two and Varia Ridge round three when they would blow over it in Operation Totalize and he fought his way into the basements of Roconcor. And he was my first introduction really to, well, Terry introduced me to Roconcor in 1995, but John uh, gave me uh, that, that company commander's perspective that was so critical. Um, and we've incorporated, one of the, the our, our modern Greg Center program is, is a derivative of the Canadian Battlefields uh, Foundation study tour program that Terry invented that I got to see from the, from, the, from the ground floor as we built that first one. It's all about the ground as you've heard uh, from everyone in the series so far. Uh, our particular job with the Greg Center's uh, programming in, the, in this whole exercise is to make this relevant for teachers. Because it's one thing to tell these stories and make this information available to the general public, or sorry, to, uh, to those who are specialists, to those who are well read in, in the historiography of the Battle for Normandy, those who, who are aware of the military minutia. But what do you do with teachers from across Canada who need to use this to find ways to make this curriculum relevant? to their students in every province and territory across the country, in urban environments and rural environments, particularly in urban environments where there's lots of new Canadians, they have a totally different requirement uh, for visiting Normandy. And we learned that from the front end and the, the very first time we worked with Blake, that's the back of his melon there uh, in 2019. Uh, we, we learned that from the very first time we started working with Blake in, in 2008 and realized we had to change the game. And what we realized in doing that, in changing that game, was that it was a worthwhile exercise for applying to everyone, because arguably everyone needs to start from a basic perspective about why these things matter to Canada uh, and how they can be, how they can transcend the world of the specialist, well-read learner and, and be relevant to, to Canadian society at large. And arguably, we all need to do this. If, we, if we're going to pound the table and demand that people remember these things, do we want them to remember it without understanding it, or do we want them to understand it? And if we want them to understand it, we have to make it accessible. So this teacher's program really has drug us as, in a collaborative way to thinking about how to do that effectively. And one of the things that it has made us really question most of all is the use and abuse of the historian's power to be the judge and the jury of the people of the past. And I put this photograph up of these two cats with very, uh, very, very carefully chosen, George Kitching and Guy Simmons, Italian campaign veterans, Sicily, Sicily veterans really, who brought their combat experience in Sicily to the Normandy campaign. And they have been both lionized and demonized by all kinds of people. Uh, rightly or wrongly. And it's, it's worth thinking about how the dominant, uh, the dominant line of inquiry in Canadian military history for decades has been on the question of combat effectiveness. Ever since Charles Stacey made those remarks that Terry referred to on the first webinar about Canadian soldiers being relative, comparatively ineffective, uh, in their training and their and their operational effectiveness in, in the Normandy campaign, ever since he made that judgment, it's gone off and rolling, and it's and it's caused a reaction that Terry led the the charge against that Mark added to it, I've added to it when it comes to Italy, and a, a whole bunch of people have gotten up to to to, to fight that fight. But have we done enough? Have, is, can that be over now? And we can forget trying to be the judges of the people of the past. And really, the question that Terry planted in my mind as an MA student was, it's, it's not the best use of our time, okay? It's really not. Far better to invest that time in trying to understand why the people of the past made the decisions that they did in order to solve the problems of their time and to understand those problems as they did in their context, because that skill is so powerful. And it's one of the things that we realized was relevant to teachers today to suspend judgment, to understand why people made tough choices the way they did, sometimes ones that don't make ethical sense or moral sense in a, in a 2021 kind of lens, but they do in a 1944 sense in a different set of, of global circumstances. And that skill, that ability to understand a different perspective is so 
essential in our society for young people drinking from the fire hose of learning on the internet. So, well, where did the heck did this come from? This, this comes from the, this goes back to the beginning. This is a foundation story, like a Marvel story, or an origin story, sorry. That's, I think that's the way they talk about it in the comic book world, isn't it? Uh, I got, put that photograph up on the upper left. That's, look at all of us. We were soldiers once and young. Uh, there's Terry and Linda in the upper left. Sir, dirty, dirty, dirt slinger, dirt, Serge Dirt slinger beside him. Um, you, for those of you who know Johnny Rickard from the Lord Strathcona's horse, he's there in the middle with that striped shirt on. There's Mike Bechtold in the center sitting down, that great map maker and uh, specialist on Royal Canadian Air Force and air power in the Second World War. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of important, well, some important uh, things and ideas evolved out of that first year. And including uh, the, the idea of using nine passenger vans to get around the countryside rather than a big bus. Because with our nine passenger vans, we could get into little corners and places that you just can't get to with a coach. This ain't no fucking battle or bus tour. We used to mumble under our breaths. And it was the origin of what we, what Dave Patterson later dubbed second Canadian unarmored carrier regiment. We even have a, a cat badge and uh, you can, you for a small price can get one if you wish, if uh, Dave is still making them. Uh, I didn't put up an image or one of those up. So I, I got, my whole world view changed as a result of this experience with Terry uh, and my friends, uh, particularly Mike and, and Serge in 1995. Uh, it made me ask new questions. It made me see the way people navigate the earth as a problem to solve in order to meet the problems of their time. So understanding terrain uh, became essential to me. And this whole process grew quite quickly uh, in 1999, 2000, 2001, when we were kicking around the idea of Laurier tours for the general public, when there were still veterans around to bring over with us as a way to gener generate revenue for the center, that didn't work so well. We were, you know, Terry, you know, we were lousy business people, wanted to give too much away, wanted to do too much for too little money. And uh, we weren't very good. We were great at running study tours, but lousy at, uh, at making money from it. And there's a lot of other people in that space now. We don't need to be there. Uh, our mission is really students and, and getting the uh, arming people with, with good ideas. But nonetheless, those early experiences were very valuable in cementing the ideas, cementing the concept for students and soldiers, and laying out the fabric for how we were going to do point 67, why, we, why point 67 mattered, and, that, and, and other, other places that could be used as learning sites. And Terry is there standing on the monument. Uh, that the Toronto Scottish built on Point 67 in 2000 and 2001. It was unveiled in those years. There we are in the fall of 2001 with the rain pouring down because Normandy is a place where there are cows, calvados, and rain. Uh, and all the sunny pictures that you often see from June and July have to be balanced with ones like this when you can't see nothing in 10 tenths cloud and it gives you a sense of what the bomber crews could see over D-Day. Uh, nonetheless, this image gives you, or it's, it's a great, little view uh, that will gives you a sense of the gravel pad that existed on point 67 when the monument first went up. Uh, nothing like that beautiful garden you saw in the opening video clip. Um, so my experience with Terry evolved uh, as his own knowledge and project work evolved for, for Fields of Fire and then Cinderella Army. And it led to the tour that Brandy went on in 2003 when the CBF decided that we were going to run a tour just to Italy. All Sicily and Italy hadn't been done before. So for that reason, it was top heavy with brass, if you like. Uh, at the time, David Patterson went over as the tour lead and the, and the, and the CBF representative. And uh, there was a triumvirate of fools, <laughs> myself in the center there, Mike Boer. Uh, from the Deuxième Regiment Blende de Canada and the Royal Military College, and Colonel Doug Delaney from the Patricias, also a professor of history at the Royal Military College. We were we worked with Dave on on delivering that puppy and really wrecking a lot of things out for the first time. It was wrecky as we went. We we tore around with the group by day and and do uh, wrecky at night for stands to to map things out. And for me, it was a chance to build on my own knowledge of the ground that I first got when Terry put me on a train in 1996 and sent me to Italy on my own. And Brandy, you were right. My Italian back then was pretty raw. It's, it's, in, it's improved a little bit. Cindy, Cindy's still far better than I am, but I, I, I can get by. I can get by all right. 
a 2003 experience evolved into a, a UNB uh, initiative to stand up courses, undergraduate and graduate courses in, uh, in Sicily and Italy from 2005 on. And that's arguably why the foundation hasn't really gotten back to Italy again, because what they've done instead is sponsor students to come on these uh, UNB programs that we typically run in May uh, in the shoulder season in Italy. Uh, and those include uh, Canadian Armed Forces officers. We've run this in partnership in the past with the Combat Training Center at Base Gagetown, the home of the Army, Whoop. and also the, the Canadian uh, Forces College and the Joint Command and Staff Program until the uh, Deficit Reduction Action Plan killed all that good stuff. But we still we, we still go over, still went the most recently in 2019, and hopefully we'll go again. Uh, so if you're interested, you can you can talk to us about that. But it was in 2008. After a couple of years of Jeff and Terry helping out Blake with a, a unique teacher's tour, that Terry finally said, hey, Lee, Cindy, why don't you go over in 2008 with this Blake Seward guy? He's a bit of a nut, and I think you guys would probably get along all right. And an idea was born, and we've been running hard ever since to try to create this new concept of engaging teachers so that they could make this relevant and accessible in their classrooms. And this, this photograph in particular is from our 2012 group and we're down at the Saint Lambert uh, Canadian Battlefields Foundation Belvedere and Learning Site, uh, not too far from Falaise, uh, the, the, the bookend, if you like, to the Point 67 site. But there's a, this photograph is very powerful because there's a whole lot of, of influential teachers who from that 2012 experience went on to do great things. There are a number of Governor General's award-winning teachers on there who took this education programming, ran with it, electrified their students, and, and electrified their students to do extraordinary new primary source research and generate new findings and new understanding about the Second World War. And, and it got kids activated because they didn't just have to read and memorize dates and, and facts. They got to do history. Uh, I can see Ryan McMahon and Dave Alexander over to the left uh, Kareem Bartlett, who's a principal at the school upriver from me here now in New Brunswick, Rob Jardine over on the right, uh, Alan Sears is there from our Faculty of Education here at UNB, um, they're just a, a powerful group, and we've had dozen, well over a dozen of these powerful groups that have gone on to do important things in every province in the country in a learning environment. And one of the central pillars of it is the Lest We Forget program. Uh, that Blake invented. Many of you are familiar with it. It's the one that gives you the access to, to personnel files uh, to be able to do primary source, so for everyone to be able to do primary source evidence uh, work on Canadian soldiers killed in action in the First World War and the Second World War. Some of you are familiar with the fact that these personnel files have been made available for all of those, even those not killed in action for the First World War as a centennial project. But this originated as an idea that Blake had when he would take his own students over before we started this teacher's program, he would take his own students over from Smith's Falls High School or Collegiate Institute uh, to and, and visit the places that the soldiers on the Smith's Falls Cenotaph, cenotaph uh, were buried at. And an idea was born and the Library and Archives picked it up and made it regularized and made it national. Uh, but it was originally based on Blake's demand from Library and Archives that they make accessible personnel files, one for every student in his classroom. And it, uh, the example I wanted to share with you today is, is a guy who resonates with me. And one of the reasons this program is so powerful is because it enables every student to make a personal connection. So they don't just have to memorize names and dates. They have to learn stuff in order to learn about their guy or woman, their gal. Their, and they pick that person based on a person from their family, a person from their hometown who's on the hometown cenotaph, a person from their the local reserve unit or regular force unit that's in their area, or a person maybe of their ethnic background, if they're indigenous, an indigenous soldier, uh, a Japanese Canadian soldier, uh, a female, whatever, whatever it is that the student wants to make a connection with and learn more about, we've got this system that a teacher can, can help their students find the right person and open up the doorway to the past through that person. This person matters a lot to me, uh, Jim Wanamaker. He matters because he's a sapper. I'm no, for those of you who know me, I'm not a sapper. I'm a black hatter who then turned into an infanteer. Uh, so I, I but uh, you know, engineers have saved my life by time. So I do have a great appreciation from them. This guy matters to me uh, because he was a sapper killed on the 23rd of August, 1944, technically the day after we consider the end of the Battle of Normandy, right around 
uh, that, that end of the Battle of Normandy at the close of Operation Tractable and the closing of the Falaise Gap. And he's killed trying to lift a mine. And the, the mine, or he did, but he's not killed. He's not killed, right? He's, he's from Saskatchewan. He's from a wee town uh, um, at Pass Trail near Nipawin along the Saskatchewan River from not very far from the, the Campbell Dam uh, head pond that they call Tobin Lake. Um, and he joined up with all of his brothers, all four of his other brothers, all joined the Royal Canadian Engineers. One of his brothers actually in Ninth Field Squadron with him. Um, and he joined when he had two kids. You know, he, he was born in 1915, so he was a little older than the common volunteer you think of. Uh, he volunteered in 1941. Uh, he was obviously proved himself to be leadership material because he was promoted first Lance Corporal and Corporal fairly early on in his service uh, and co confirmed in that rank and by 1943. So he's a, a section commander uh, in, in his engineer squadron, uh, helping to lift mines and, and drive armored engineer, or not armored engineer vehicles, but engineer vehicles around the battlefield for fourth armored division in these actions in late July and um, the uh, in August. But he doesn't come ashore until the 22nd of, of July while Operation Atlantic is finishing. His whole war is confined to uh, really Verrier Ridge and, and the move beyond it, the final move beyond it. And that's where he dies. He's buried at Brettville. And it matters to me too, because of my own experience with Afghanistan, he's killed by an IED, not a mine. It's, it's, a, it's an IED, it's a booby trap, a booby, an IED by a different word, uh, a different term, an improvised explosive device. And it kills people in the way that I'm quite familiar with, rips one foot off, smashes another foot, compound fracture in the jaw in a bunch of places, ga massive gash in his stomach. Uh, and his friends and his comrades pick him up, patch him up, stabilize him in the way that they're trained to do with the first aid of their day. Uh, and, and he's still breathing when they pass him on. Um, but his body's been too badly shaken by this massive explosion and, and he dies of his wounds. Uh, but for me, this experience of losing a sapper to an improvised explosive device, a weapon system we associate with another war, for me, this is a continuity and change moment. For me, it's a moment that helps me understand my, my own experience and the experience of a, an entire new generation of Canadian veterans uh, and how it's perhaps more similar to that Second World War experience that we sometimes want to want to think of. Now, point 67 is a place that we, we don't use the way you might think, or we use it in a, in a lot of ways. One of the great things about it is if you walk to the north end of point 67, you can see Calm. You can see Calm very well. There's Cindy Brown on the right-hand side of this picture. Behind her to the north, this picture is facing to the, uh, to the west. So behind her to the north, you get this magnificent view of Calm. And there she's running a site inter or a, a, a photograph and map uh, comparison exercise where the students are, are calculating the battle damage uh, as a result of the bombing of Caen and comparing it to other German uh, events and in, in doing counterpartisan work in southern France uh, for, uh, to, and to, to think about what has to happen in a community after uh, a, a combat is over. And this, this adds a, a critical element to our program. It's, it, it was there from the outset with the CBF, but for teachers who have to deal with students on this, it's, it's a really powerful theme and question uh, that's emerged out of this uh, Greg Center War in the Canadian Experience Teachers Program. The, you can't fight a war anywhere or virtually anywhere in the world without encountering civilians, and especially in densely populated Europe. And a lot of the teachers, and, and Cindy asked this question from the very first time I started working with her, uh, this is all well and good that we're talking about soldiers and how they interact here, but I see a lot of towns and villages and the townspeople would always come out to speak to Cindy, first in Italian when we worked there and then later in, in French and uh, as we worked together in France, and uh, with, with stories to share. And stories that were pretty important to the military activity, uh, both as a consequence and often in relation to how things go. And so we started, uh, you, this, this point 67 base became a, a base to expand the relationships we had with communities in Normandy, mirroring the kind of uh, relationships we have with communities in, in uh, Italy. And one of the most important relationships that has come out, come out of this is the one forged 
by John Edmondson, Colonel John Edmondson of the Saskatchewan Regiment in rural Concord, that, that the, the village on the other side of Verrier Ridge uh, that has become our second home when we go to Normandy. Uh, they invite us in every year. Uh, they welcome us as our, they call us our Canadian, their Canadian cousins. Uh, and this is a town, for those of you who are familiar with the story of, op of the battles for Verrier Ridge and the final destruction of it in Operation Totalize, that was virtually obliterated. Uh, and yet, and, and we can talk about this in the Q&A if you like, and yet these people still celebrate Canada. And Terry introduced us to that reality and the, the monument that they put up there to their liberators when we first went to, when I first went to Rocancor in 1995 with them. But as a result of talking with the locals further, we've really uh, dug into their stories. And every year the mayor, Denis Vial, uh, brings out survivors to speak to our students and our teachers uh, about their experiences. And this proves to be one of the most powerful parts of the program. One of the ones that the teachers comment on directly as, one, as, a, as an experience that they can make relevant in their classrooms. And that includes the experience that the people of Roconcourt had with Canadian soldiers after the battle was over and they emerged from the mine shafts that they had been hiding in because there was a, a strong French resistance cell in the area that got everybody down in the mine shafts before uh, the heavy bombers came in and smashed the German positions uh, on, the, on the German main line of resistance there on the eve of Operation Totalize. So they understand, they, their perspective is their town had to die in order to save France. And that blows our teachers' minds. Uh, and it's, it's all the more reason to, to, to go there and, and, and have them ponder that horrific question of, can you sacrifice your town in order to save the world? Uh, that, this photograph kind of speaks to the, the importance of our, of our partnership with them. And that there's Mayor Villar. He's, uh, I, I don't think he's going to stand for re-election again, but he's been a powerful force to make Roconcor a a tremendous community in the Normandy landscape. And it's a central feature on the backside of a Verrier Ridge that really connects Point 67 on to uh, the area that the Brett Vilser lays, the plateau that the Brett Vilser lays cemetery is located on. And he's given us, he and his family and the members of the community have given us so many opportunities for the teachers to immerse themselves in the ground and the community uh, in ways that we could never get at before, including uh, doing crazy shit like this. Uh, and it's, it's tremendously deepened our awareness of the landscape there that from my own perspective as an operational military historian has enhanced my understanding of, of the way that earth rolls uh, and the way it, it uh, determined what had to happen in late July and August of 1944. And that's perhaps where I want to, the, 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 the big uh, rock that I want to throw out there into the pond and see what ripples it stirs up. Because what I see is that the judgment about how far or not far the Canadians advanced in Operation Atlantic or in Operation Spring or in Operation Totalize is missing the point. Because for too long we have had conversations about Canadian, the Canadian Army in the Battle of Normandy, for that matter, in, in Sicily and Italy, about capturing ground and advancing. And this is a pretty contentious issue. The, sol the soldiers I work with today at the Combat Training Center and in two brigade out here in Eastern Canada uh, and five brigade as well in Quebec, we all talk about the idea that the combat mission for com combat arms units is not to attack ground, but to attack force. Uh, and that's a modern way of seeing the, the military problem of how to defeat the enemy. Uh, but back in the Second World War, in the First World War, there was more, more discussion of capturing ground and advancing. And we could go into a whole long discussion about the semantics of this, but it's safe to say that senior leaders were uncomfortable talking about the true intent of a lot of these missions. Although uh, my friend Dave Dixon, who was the brigade major for Nine Brigade, uh, former Carlton York officer, wound up at the North North Nova Scotia Highlanders, later commanded a company of the North uh, North Nova, has always said. Now, we understood the intent. We understood that when we were issued orders to advance to a location from point A to point B, that it was because the intelligence staff had determined that there was an enemy force that existed somewhere between point A and point B. And we were going to go out there and we were going to kill them. We were going to meet them and we were going to kill them. We were either going to get to the objective first and dig in 
as were our doctrine called for and lay on the defensive fire missions, lay on the artillery, get the tanks into good fire positions, get the light machine guns into good uh, fire positions and cut the bastards down when they come out of their hidey holes to launch their counterattack. And that would be the way that we would kill the German army and perhaps convince some of its members to surrender themselves. And arguably that's what happened in Operation Atlantic, in Operation Spring, in Operation Totalize. However, and, and Terry's laid that out in detail in his books uh, in, in, in Cinderella Army. Um, Mark has obviously made that case powerfully uh, for this in the Stopping the Panzers uh, book for how that works in the brigade and the divisional fortress position in, the, in, in June. But the same process occurs at every step of the in, from the invasion of Sicily all through the uh, advance up the Italian peninsula and every step of the way from the Normandy beaches to the closing of Falaise Gap and arguably right to 1945. That there is a killing system that works really well. And we're really comfortable in Canada talking about our war dead and the great sacrifices that they made. But we seem to be less comfortable. And Alan, this is something that Alan Sears, our education faculty member here at UNB, has really been cap. I don't want to say captivated by it. that's a too horrific way to describe it. He's, he's been appalled by coming with us on our teachers programs to see how much we drive home the point that that uh, this is a killing exercise. This is a killing process, and it won't end until the Germans decide to stop dying. Until that dug in, well-armed, well-motivated, very efficient, well-educated, well-organized German army that's dug in on, on and behind Varia Ridge is dead. Nobody's going over it. Uh, so ultimately what we see is a process of battering it, eroding it in concert with our allies. You can't separate the Canadian experience from the, from the Scottish experience to the east and the British airborne experience further east of that, or the Polish experience. Can't separate it from second British Army's experience uh, in, the, in the Swiss Norman to the west. Can't separate it from the American experience in the Operation Cobra breakout. Our history makes better sense when we tell it in an international context, rather than trying to compartmentalize it and tie, tell only a Canadian bite-sized story, because then it becomes irrelevant and nonsensical if we don't tie in what's happening on the flanks beyond our boundaries. Uh, and when you do integrate it together, you see how this killing system does contribute to the erosion of the German army, but it's friggin' costly. And as I said to someone a few days ago, uh, it, it's a lot, it, it's not that different from what we saw in 2006 and 2007 in Kandahar in, in that respect, in that it takes a lot of effort to kill people who don't, who want to shoot at you, who want to kill you, and are prepared to die in the process of doing so, and who are very well motivated in their cause. It takes hard work. And that hard work forces people to kill. And you can't help but be changed by that process. And for those of you with family members who endured this, you know, not everyone is a drunk under the bench. Of course, many veterans come back resilient, made more resilient by their experience in the Second World War, or the First World War for that matter. But there's no way that they're not affected on, on, a, on a very deep level in their hearts and their souls as a result of killing, uh, nearly being killed, watching people be killed, it, it affects a person's DNA. And the whole country is arguably, my own family was, was ripped apart by the First and Second World Wars that led to serious alcoholism in certain family members that turned into abuse against other family members that turned into anxiety disorder for other family members. And the whole family is a, a, an intergenerational trail of, of disaster, but also resilience in the case of other uh, uncles that came home as and, and endured the experience relatively well and found ways to live positively. So we can't generalize about the people who survived being part of this killing machine, but we have to be clear that they were killers and became arguably very good at it, in part because they had that tremendous tail behind them that involved the majority of them that was really about sustaining the killing system and ensuring that there would be enough firepower, enough ammunition to throw at those German counterattacks that when any German soldier emerged from his fire trench and got behind, got behind a panzer and assault gun to deliver an immediate counterattack, they would walk into a wave of 303 rifle and Bren gun and Vickers fire, a 75 millimeter Sherman fire, six pounder HE, 17 pounder Sabo, 
the whole and, and everything high explosive that the Royal Canadian Art Artillery can throw in an indirect way into a storm of fire of the sort that Michael Whitman met his end on. So, but, but it's costly. We know it's costly. And we've been commemorating the dead for a long time. So now on this 30th of June, as the Downey Foundation has been telling so many stories of, of indigenous people in Canada who are now grieving the loss of their loved ones that they can't see in the same way that family members who lost loved ones in Normandy and for whom a, a passage across the Atlantic was, was out of the realm of the possible. I, I'm now wondering in this time if there's a way that those of us who are familiar uh, with treating the dead who, have, who are buried far from home can bring some of that insight uh, to this question of how we're going to wrestle with this problem of our time. Could this be just one of the ultimate past into present learning activities uh, where we take that knowledge uh, and awareness of the care and precision required to look after uh, Canada's tens of thousands of war dead and figure out uh, how to support our indigenous communities as they come to grips with commemorating and, and, and repatriating remains uh, across this country. Um, it's, it's, it's something that's been on my mind a great deal in these last weeks when we stood up this webinar, uh, Kamloops hadn't happened yet, um, but it, or the, the, the discovery hadn't happened yet, even though the commission report suggested that it was going to at some point. Uh, well, now it's here and we can't look away. Uh, we, we need to look this in the face together and it's, it's part of the story too. Uh, I really appreciate your patience. I wanted to shut up 10 minutes ago, but uh, I, 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 Terry and Mark gave me a sick disease and uh, uh, here we are. So now we got time for questions. Thanks so much, Lee. Um, give me one second. I just got to turn some lights on and then I'll come back in for the Q&A. Just give me one quick second here. I gotta say it's freaking humid right now in the basement of the Greg Center at the uh, at Mahalo Dilly Hall at, uh, uh, at the University of New Brunswick Fredericton campus. I'm sweating a blue streak. It's a good thing I have no pants on. <laughs> Yeah, I'm uh, I'm feeling it too up in my 15th floor apartment where heat only rises. Um, so we got a, a ton of questions here, Lee, but before I, I dive into them, I just want to say, first of all, thanks for a great talk. Um, and I think a really good way to wrap things up at the end and bringing us up to the present. And I think had really interesting ideas of, you know, how we have thought about commemorating the war dead might address how we think about repatriating and commemorating remains of Indigenous children um, who um, died during the residential school, um, ex their, their residential school experiences. But before we turn to the questions, I would like to uh, quickly remind everyone I've, I've shared with you again at the bottom of your screen in the chat function, um, how you can purchase two of Lee's books that we have available tonight. Uh, the first is Loyal Gunners, Third Field Artillery Regiment in the History of New, New Brunswick's Artillery. Right. Read at 2012. Um, we, act, we had that one available previously with uh, Mark Milner, but the Wilfrid Laurier University Press has been kind to extend the discount code for that. Um, so again, just check in your chat function. You'll see where to uh, find it and what discount code to use to purchase it. The second book we have available is uh, Steel Cavalry, the 8th New Brunswick Hussars and the Italian Campaign. Um, it's available at Chapters for the very low price of actually less than $20. So again, go to uh, go again to the chat function and you will uh, find out how to purchase it there. So lots of questions, Lee, they were coming in throughout uh, the talk. Um, so why don't we just jump right into them? Um, I brought my cavalry saber. I am a galloping as our, and I'm ready to go. <laughs> um, so you, you mentioned at the beginning, Lee, and this is a, a question that came in at the beginning um, through several audience members. Um, I'm sure you'll know one of them, Randy Wakelam. He's in, uh, in Kingston. Um, and he wants you to, to talk a little bit more about why this kind of inability um, or refusal to treat Point 67 like sites um, of Juno Beach. Why do we? Why are these other areas 
um, they loom so large in the public memory, whereas 0.67 does not? It, it's a good question, and, and it's, it, it's touching, it's sensitive. Um, first and foremost, uh, if you look at any one of the activities we do with the teachers that we bring overseas with us is to look at uh, high school history textbooks that have been published over the years that are increasingly falling out of favor because learning methods have moved beyond singular narrative textbooks. But the fact of the matter is there's a heck of a lot of them out there. And for some teachers who have been dumped into a history class from a science background and told that they have to teach it, it might be the only resource they have. And those textbooks often deal with the Second World War by tackling Hong Kong, Dieppe, uh, the Japanese deportation, and D-Day, war's over, move on to the next section. So really, we've seen a, a, a simplification. The, the public has, has gravitated in a, in a way that those of us who are First World War uh, historians, and I guess I count myself as one of those too from the work I did on the artillery in the First World War for Loyal Gunners, in the way that Vimy dominates the headlines in, in the First World War, Juno Beach has become that for the Second World War. And it's a question we pose to the teachers year after year, and it's interesting to see the perspectives that they come up with. Um, a lot of them get that D-Day matters because there's so much that leads into it. Arguably Sicily and the Italian campaign and the bomber effort, the Battle of the Atlantic can all be conceived of as, as, as enabling activities that enable D-Day. So if you think of D-Day as a bridge between what happens before and what happens after, it's a pretty good day to focus on. But unfortunately, I don't think too many people use it at, in that way. It's more about the day and the, the 360 odd uh, Canadians killed on that day. And, and I think that the, the, the focus therein, the oversimplified focus takes away from the complexity of First Canadian, or First Canadian multinational armies experience uh, in the area south of Caen. And uh, no disservice to, to the Juneau Beach Center, but the location of JBC on the beach reinforces that. I know uh, our good friends and colleagues at JBC do a lot of work to try to bring people uh, south of, of Con to go to Point 67. And Lord knows Terry and all and Mike Bechtold and all the people who have been, Matt Sims, um, and most recently Matt Baker, all the people involved in creating the guidebooks so that Canadians can self-guide themselves around the Normandy beaches is, is, has been powerful at getting people beyond the beach. But it still hasn't been enough because the popular narrative is so friggin' dominant that I hear it myself and I, I get called, we get calls all the time. And I'm sure, Randy, you get them too at RMC from people who know you. Hey, I'm going to, going to France and I was going to rent a car and drive to Normandy for two or three days. And I want, can you tell me how to get to the beaches? That's, that's the only thing they're going to see because that's the only thing they really know about in popular culture. It's the only thing that Peter Mansbridge has ever really mentioned on, on the National or on Remembrance Week. Uh, and and I, there's, there's another reason. I think it has a lot to do with the controversy. It's nice to tell the Juno Beach story. It's all smiles and chuckles and unicorns because we came ashore, it was bloody, but it was successful and everybody agrees it was successful. There's a nice, happy consensus. But everything that happens after that is controversial and it's mired in anger. It's mired in anger at veterans who... And I don't know any veteran in the world who is happy with an outcome that results in fatal casualties among their friends, myself included. Full stop on that. So veterans are perfectionists. When an operation occurs that they lose brothers and sisters in arms in, they start to search inward about how they could have done it better with less loss of life. And that is often the source of the negative criticism, the criticism of uh, Canada's military effectiveness in the First and Second World War it comes from the vets themselves who, who want, from the officers, from the NCOs who lost men under their command and, and, and who carry the weight of their decisions and the responsibility for those deaths in their souls and they carry it to their, to their own graves. Uh, that has fed this inquiry into that, that line of inquiry into how it could have been done better. And it makes it just too messy to deal with. But what we found by taking teachers there to point 67 and, and immersing them in the debates, are not, and not necessarily in an oversimplified way, but in an accessible way, ground, you know, grounding it and, and perhaps boiling it down 
boiling the debates down, is we've introduced teachers to the fact that historians can debate the past. And there's not a singular narrative. There are multiple perspectives. And by God, isn't that something we need all students to learn how to do right now? Uh, so they don't, they don't, you know, at first we think teachers are going to be, be terrified. Or at first, when, when I started doing this, uh, Cindy and Blake were farther ahead than me in, in, in recognizing that teachers would be comfortable and their students would be comfortable with controversy because it's everywhere, right? Every event is, is politicized in our, in our world. No, no two people see the same thing exactly the same way. There's always going to be competing perspectives and debate over what just happened yesterday and what it means for the country. So how can we expect the Battle of Normandy to be any different? So rather than shy away from that debate, I, I think so. I think what's happened, Randy, is that, uh, and I hope Peanut's okay. Uh, Randy's son Christian came with us on the 2003 uh, tour with Brandy, by the way. So that's a personal aside. I would say that to Randy in the in the aisle if we were all in person in an auditorium. Uh, I, I just think that we historians have often been too afraid to, uh, to to deal with the messiness of debate when talking to the public. I think more recently we've gotten our our, our profession has gotten more comfortable in doing that, and and we now our generation sees it as necessary. And people like Terry and Mark blazed away, you know, and arguably by launching furious attacks against the uh, the, the dominant paradigms, and and we've change the game and let's keep doing it. Um, Lee, why don't we get into the, um, the battle itself um, and um, the Battle of Normandy. I've got an, actually an interesting question from Dave Alexander in Owen Sound. Um, he, he's wondering how your studies of the Italian campaign, given that you said you're a historian of the Italian campaign in Sicily, um, how that has inf informed your analysis and work on the Battle of Normandy. Oh, Dave, you know that's a planted question. Dave's an old friend. You saw his picture in the 2012 picture, or in, in the 2012 uh, photo on Saint Lambert. But it, it is important. Um, my work on Italy, uh, going from Sicily all the way through to the Gothic line, has really made me look closely at this at this killing system. This this system that's made to to move groups of soldiers and machines uh, across a kill zone, uh, to successfully navigate the movement across the kill zone, uh, to seize a piece of ground that can then be used to facilitate the killing process. So for me, uh, the study of the breakthrough actions in the Leary Valley uh, that have been roundly criticized by historians and the study of the breakthrough actions in the Gothic line that have been roundly criticized by historians who wanted to measure effectiveness by ground gained and by sweeping encirclements uh, conducted as if it was if it would, was going to be possible for the Canadian and allied forces to conduct a wide encirclement of the German army the same way the Germans did to the French and the Poles and the Russians in the early days of the Second World War when they were dealing with opponents that didn't have the same level of inter-unit inter communications and firepower and air power as the, as the Germans did in those early years. Uh, when you've got two opponents that are uh, fairly well matched in terms of firepower, ethos, uh, communications capacity, command and control, indirect fire weapons, encirclement is, is it ain't happening until the opposing force is sufficiently dead that you can encircle the, the, the fleeing survivors as happened at the end of the Battle of Normandy. So that means that any attempt to, what we see as breakthrough attempts are what I've seen, it started, I saw it in Italy. And then I, uh, when I went back to do totalize after I'd done my MA thesis with Terry, I really saw it there. Uh, the breakthrough from the Gothic line had a lot of similar, and the breakthrough from the Hitler line had a lot of similarities uh, to, the, to Operation Totalize in that, we saw infantry divisions backed by some armor and some artillery obliterating and fighting at the, the main line of resistance at the same time that armored battle groups were pushed through the breach to seize pivots. And we often think about seizing those pivots as a fight to capture ground and commence the advance to Berlin. But if we look real close at the way they understood those activities at the time, it's to grab ground that you can get a forward observation officer onto who can bring down fire on any German 
units that move in reaction to the seizure of that ground. And there's no flame and better example than at Verrier Ridge on the 25th of July when, uh, when the Black Watch can't get to their, their uh, attack position or their, their, their objective to, to mount that defense against the counterattacks, but the Royal Island Light Infantry uh, do with Rockingham, with Rocky Rockingham over in Verrier Village. And the same thing in, in uh, the battle or in Operation Totalize when everybody's familiar with, with the infamous Worthington force that gets lost uh, and cut off and decimated because it's not in the right location it's supposed to be in. So when the foos call for fire, the fire comes down in the wrong place. But if you compare that to other armored combat teams that do get on the right objective and their foos are able to see German units moving in reaction and they can see German tanks and infantry and trucks moving in the open, those are the kind of words that foos love to speak into the mic and the gunners and the fire control centers love to hear and they will flick and fling the shells at a rapid rate with all the, 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 the industry they have at their, uh, uh, that's all the energy that's possible because that's what's going to win the war. It's creating the conditions that induce the German army to move because when it's moving and it's not hiding and dug in, you can kill it. Sorry. Lee, I want, I want to build off of your idea of these kill of a killing zone or killing systems and a question from uh, another colleague, Robert Dinesh. I think he's in Windsor right now. Um, Robert, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but he's wondering, again, in this context of a killing system, what um, or how Canadian Army measured combat effectiveness during this time? Well, I think this is the heart of the, 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 the controversy. Uh, orders of the time are written in terms of, you know, the, the, the Black Watch will advance from its start line in vicinity of St. Andreas Aurora and advance to and through and ultimately seize and capture fontenay la marion Operation Spring, and secure a firm base for, for further exploitation. Um, so orders are written in terms of advancing from A to B. And, but implicit in that, in the doctrine, is that other story of advancing as far as you can go until you meet the enemy. And this goes back to, to Mark and Terry's first two, first two presentations as well, that at any given time, no officer is expecting someone to go blazing off to an objective when they're in the middle, when they meet the enemy in a, in a, in a meeting engagement. The moment you make contact with the enemy, you stop, drop, and roll, as we used to say when I first joined the Army, uh, to acquire targets and start shooting back. Because if you keep trying to advance after you've made contact, you will be dead before him. And in the words of George Patton, you're supposed to make the other poor dumb bastard die for his country. So um, the, the uh, yeah, the, but so many, Veterans understood that nuance, that the order to go to an objective really meant meeting the enemy in or around that objective and, and seeing them off. But a lot of others don't. And we see it recorded in history. We see it recorded in their war diaries that the unit advanced and captured its objective and it was great. Uh, and then they repelled a counterattack as if repelling it, as if beating it off. They use language like beating off the counterattack as if sending off the Germans packing was, 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 the, was the great goal for the day. But the real implied goal in there is killing the German counterattack, killing the German infantry that come out into the open to close up to your defenses, to destroy the German tanks that move out into the open. But it's hard for a human being to kill someone. So maybe it's comfortable that the language exists that way. It's different from the way the attrition language read in, uh, in, in reports and war diaries from the First World War. So one of the things I've often wondered, and I've even written something to this effect, is that there seems to be a reaction in the Second World War to the kind of attritional goals and language of the First World War, that you have to spend blood to, to draw blood. And nobody wants to fight the Second World War the same way. Uh, so, and, and there's a lot of evolving thinking on this because I think st people still in the early days of the Second World War, when the Canadian Army was training in the United Kingdom, 
hoped that this new war would be one with technology and movement and airplanes and vehicles and radios and, and mobility. And when, when it came down to brass tacks, or, or when it came down to boots and bayonets and grenades and fists uh, and small arms fire and bursting shells, the veterans among them and those who learned from those veterans in while well, militia NCOs and officers in the 1930s, they realized that this war was gonna be not very much different from the last one. And in the end, we're going to have to kill our way to Berlin. Um, Lee, you mentioned earlier in your talk um, of how, um, you know, Terry and Mark brought this new narrative of the Second World War um, to the fore. But a question coming from, sorry, I lost her name here. Yes, Norma Graham. Um, and I think a good question here, because we just saw the, the release of Jonathan Fennell's book, um, Commonwealth Armies in the Second World War. She's asking how historians outside of Canada, uh, whether it's British, French, or American, have understood Canada's role at Normandy, and if their views have changed over time as our historiography has evolved. Well, that's the, I, that may be the sad part, yet there's a bit of a time lag in the way the Brits and the Americans understand this. I think they're getting it now, uh, because enough of us all see each other at international conferences that then we we... we we rail at them when they make flippant comments about Canadian performance at, uh, in conference papers when they're talking about a British question or an American question. And uh, we've all had a go at Russell Hart. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, people, uh, I think our American and British colleagues are catching up now, but there was a delay. And you've got those popular historians like Beaver and, and Hastings, especially. Uh, very nice chaps, both of them. But... Uh, very much uh, ones who, who rely on the old Canadian narrative that the Canadians are a bunch of bungling buffoons, a bunch of citizen soldiers who can't hold a candle. And when the Americans, and to a lesser extent, when the Americans first started uh, launching their own inquiry into whether their army sucked as bad as they thought it did in Normandy, they, they sort of put themselves on the pedestal and figured they were the ones, and, and Mark is working on this much right now in, in the book that, he's, uh, that he spoke to you a little bit about that's in, in progress. Uh, he's tracking this fairly closely. I see it in Italy a lot, that the Americans see themselves somehow as, as superior uh, to the British and Dominion system. Uh, but th those views are really changing, Norma, I think. Uh, I th but it, it, it's a process and it, it's a process that's hard to do because when a great book that gets great reviews and gets often reprinted like Max Hastings' Overlord, it's really hard to change people's thinking because once it's written and when a person who's, who's used to assuming that history is something that is written in stone, it's a singular narrative, uh, that, that, that it's hard for them to imagine that there could be an alternative point of view. And one of the things we always argue, our, our education prof, Alan Sears, always says, history is neither fixed, final, nor forever. It's always in a state of flux. Uh, and the more people we get comfortable with that, the more easy, the easier it'll be uh, to, to have people accept new ideas about the past. Because there's still so much to figure out about the First and Second World War. Not least of which, one of the big things we're working on right now at the Gregg Center is uh, we've, we've, uh, we're starting a new major project to understand Black, Indigenous, and female experiences in the, first and, in the First World War in particular, because these perspectives have been left off the table. You know, we've, we've got some token stories out there, uh, but we don't know a lot about the thousands of people of uh, representing minority groups that uh, that's, those stories are kind of swept to the side. Um, so there's still lots to learn, lots to figure out, and our paradigm is probably going to continue shifting and evolving. And that's what that's what our job as historians is to help us navigate the present by asking questions that are relevant to our time uh, about the past. And I and uh, and I think I, I'm optimistic. And one of the reasons I'm most optimistic is because, for better or for worse, the Allies won the Second World War uh, with a powerful multinational coalition that dealt with arguably the greatest crisis that humanity has ever seen until now in a climate change environment. So nations had the balance, uh, their capacity to um, uh, balance their own national interest 
with uh, global coalition uh, interests and, and, and solve this global crisis. And I think that's, we don't have any other example in human history of how to tackle a global challenge like, like climate change uh, other than the Second World War. So I think that's gonna, it, it, we fixated in years past on where the international coalition fell apart, where there was friction and tension, right? One of the questions that's always been on my mind is do we also need, not need to balance that out with how the coalition worked? Because it was better than the Axis coalition. That one was an epic fail. And we certainly don't want to model that in terms of interna international relations experience. And the international coalition that ultimately won the Second World War is the one that became the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and North American Aerospace Defense Command and the United Nations. And for better or for worse, it's the system we got. So those parts of it that work well still kind of work. And we want to want to, Cindy always says, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater when you're trying to make positive change and do away with past practice. But by God, we're making a difference. Um, Lee, we'll return to some kind of lessons in history and how we can apply that to the present because there are a number of uh, questions coming in from the audience in that regard. But I'm wondering, and this is not, it wasn't a question actually from David Patterson, your good friend. Um, I think he's in Kingston as well. Um, he, he had a comment about kind of the evolving landscape of Point 67 and how he pointed out in the beginning that it was actually a municipal garbage dump. Um, I'm wondering, and I'm just going to reformulate Dave's comment into a question. I'm wondering if you could talk to, you did a little bit in your presentation, but a little bit more of this evolving landscape of Point 67, where, what it was in its kind of infancy when Terry really took on the project of turning it into a, a memorial site uh, to where we are now. Sure. Thanks, Dave, for putting me back on track. I always, I meant to do that as part of the presentation. It was even in my notes, but no presentation survives first contact with the with the audience. So it, it, it's an important question. And by, in 1995, when Terry took us up there, the site that we now know as the park was a big, ugly, flipping dump. And the, the in-earth water reservoir, that's just another 125 yards up the road, up the dirt road, uh, onto the feature was what we had to crawl up on. And we have some great photographs of us all climbing up on that uh, coming over the fence and up the side of the bank uh, to get that great view. Um, but, and it wasn't long after that, that, uh, that Terry and then Dave got involved with brokering deals. And I know it was a lot of work to broker deals, to get the garbage cleaned up and get a big donation load of gravel from a local contractor uh, to build the gravel pad that you can see in that photograph that I had up from our 2001 visit when the, when the Toronto Scottish put in the monument. That was uh, what Terry calls stage one of the, the, the plan to turn that place into a learning site, into a memorial and learning space. Um, and then phase two, uh, Dave got involved with the Toronto Scottish Regiment. And of course, the Tor Scots being located in their armories where they are in downtown TO have a lot of uh, access to former members and current members of their association that have some dollars. And he got them behind an initiative to put a monument on top of that gravel pad that was the beginning of turning it into, taking it beyond uh, just having the ground prepped and, and, and turning it into the commemorative space and learning space by building a tablet that will be, would be both a memorial and also a stone teaching map. And then the foundation came and added the... Uh, the, the period one over 50s as well. And then the, the real, uh, I think the real victory in all this app that, that built on that initial momentum and the momentum was very much the same as the kind of friendship we have built with Roca Corps. Dave and Terry and, and, found, and key foundation members have made tremendously close relationships with people all over the Normandy area. Uh, and in particular in the St. Andre Mesa Orn space uh, that has that got the, the government, the municipal and regional department governments involved in turning that into a, a municipal park. And a lot of the stonework, a lot of the garden work that you saw in the video clip at the beginning uh, was paid for by the community that saw that this Canadian historic site was an integral piece of their own urban planning landscape. Uh, and it's, it's really made it a powerful and useful place to be because they put in a 
uh, a washroom facility and picnic facilities there, and they keep it secure. They got a fence around it to keep uh, people from partying there too much. Uh, and they maintain the grounds in, in, in a beautiful fashion. So this is really a, a wonderful example of a, of a, of a fa the foundation's partnership with the municipal government to build that site. But geez, it took a lot of work. I know it took a lot of time and effort and, and, uh, and horse trading. And David could tell you lots of stories about that, Terry too. Um, but I think it was worth it because from that space, we now have this, from that location, we now have for visitors, a, uh, if they can't get to anywhere else, they can go to one location and, and see so much of the July and August story and arguably the most important episodes of, uh, of Canada's uh, battle for Normandy. And incidentally, for those of you who have heard the Matthew Halton broadcast about uh, the, the, the dissatisfaction with the lack of a Canadian Second World War Memorial, you might recall that he, uh, he left Canadians listening to his broadcast with the idea that maybe that memorial ought to go on Verrier Ridge as the, as the Second World War equivalent to Vimy in terms of a place where most Canadians who fought in the Normandy campaign uh, fought together uh, and for a, an important achievement, the, the defeat and destruction of the large German force on and behind uh, that ridge. Thanks for, que for queuing me, Dave. Lee, I think we've got time for probably two more questions. Um, so, man, we got a lot of a lot of our friends out in the audience. Scott Sheffield out in BC. Um, Scott's, oh, got a, <laughs> Scott's got a question um, about, about the tours and, and involving the teachers. Um, and I think this is a good question because there's I, I know a number of uh, teachers out in the audience tonight. Um, and he was wondering how much initial context is, is required or needed in order for these teachers to really have a, an appreciation of the ground, the tactics and the strategical, strategic decisions that were made on the ground. Oh, Scotty, Scotty, Scotty. This is something we have wrestled with ever since we started doing it in 2008, because it's something teachers wrestle with in the classroom every day. How much do you have to pour into them from a, taking their heads back and taking the knowledge and pouring it down their throat versus how much can you, and, and Blake will always tell you, Cindy does too, uh, why not start with a powerful question? Because if you start with a powerful question and you, you, you get a kid started off with wanting to learn about how their great-grandfather got killed in the fight to cross from Point 67 to Verrier Ridge. And they find out, oh, he was a member of the, of the South Saskatchewan Regiment, or maybe the First Desires, uh, or he was a gunner in an M10. And what's an M10? So the, 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 once you start with a, with a question about how did this person come to die in Normandy, uh, you work back from there and the students have to work on coming up with what is the essential context they need to know in order to, to understand this person's story. For my guy, for, for Jim Wanamaker, what was the essential context I needed to know for 9th Field Squadron's role as part of 4th Canadian Armour Division coming ashore uh, as the last big field formation within 1st Canadian Army and then launching itself into Operation Tractable. And in order to understand the circumstances of his death, I had to understand the circumstances of his life and the existence of his subunit within the wider formation. And we always say in the act of learning about how to work a personnel file, the student has to know stuff. They have to learn stuff about how the Canadian Army works, but they learn it themselves and they learn it on their terms. And guess what? Then they retain it. Because if they're not forced to memorize it, if they're, if they're actually doing it because they're doing it as part of an inquiry-based project that they're excited to do, that they want to do, and they get to share their poster about it or a presentation about it at a history fair, holy snap, and does that ever change the level of engagement? You talk, Dave Alexander out there in the audience and any other teacher, you ask them about how their engagement levels change uh, when they go to this way of empowering students to ask important questions about the past and then arm them like a, a coach and a facilitator uh, to help them find the answers to those questions. Because isn't that what we should all be doing as educators? 
Good question, Scotty. And I got to uh, phone you soon. We got some stuff to discuss. Hope you're well. Um, Lee, and I've actually, before I go to Lee again, I just want to say to everyone, you know, there's so many questions coming in and we really do appreciate how much engagement there has been. Um, and unfortunately, we're just, we're not going to be able to answer all of the questions tonight, but Lee, if you're comfortable with it, I may forward some of the questions on to you over email afterwards from the folks out there. Um, because, you know, we've got, we've got probably another 20 or 25 questions and we really only have time for, for one more question. Um, I brought a flask so we can carry on for a while longer if anybody wants. <laughs> That's, uh, what, well, what, why don't we, why don't we do that then? Uh, Lee, if you're all right with that, because we still got 150 people out there, Jeez. Uh, clearly itching to to hear more. Um, so uh, so yeah, why don't we why don't we just keep plugging along then? Um, or I got a, I got a, a an easy one for you, Lee, um, from Robert Elliott. It was the first question of the evening. He wants to know when your Italian campaign is coming out. Italian campaign book is coming out. Jesus, Bob. Well, it, it's it's changed completely. I get there's a I've got a, working on a new book uh, about the Italian campaign, but before it comes out, I've got a, a an interesting new chapter that's really reshaped the the Gothic line book. It's a new chapter about the Battle of Ortona that I'm co-writing with one of my graduate students, who's also an army officer, uh, Major Jason Giroux of the Royal Canadian Regiment, um, or, and my uh, close associate at Tactics School for for a number of years. Uh, we've unearthed some pretty powerful new findings about the Battle of Ortona together, uh, and in in doing so, we've we've done a lot of thinking about what goes on on the boundaries of Canadian formations and their interaction with Allied formations. Um, that I think is pertinent, and that's gonna that's reshaping the way I'm doing my Gothic Line book, which we see is another Canadian core co multinational coalition story in which uh, First Canadian Corps in Italy in, in August and September becomes this powerful multinational uh, force that includes a New Zealand division, a British division, South African Air Force, uh, Army Cooperation Squadrons, a Royal Navy Task Group, and Greeks, along with Italian partisan connections in an, in an unconventional uh, setting doing uh, deep recce and other crazy things. So the, the relevance to the, to the contemporary armed forces is, is powerful in there. But the, uh, the, the, moving beyond, the moving beyond our own national story and integrating it within the multinational story is, the, is probably the undiscovered country in Canadian operational military history right now. And the foundation, all of us in the foundation have been doing it for years. Terry's been doing it for years. Mark's been doing it for years. Dave Patterson, way back when he wrote that article on Operation Windsor that finally integrated the story of the uh, battle for Carpiquet Airfield into what the British are doing down in the, the Odon and Orne River Valleys. That, that, that was a, a, a powerful example of, of what happens when you look beyond the divisional boundary uh, and you look into your allies' uh, problem space and figure out what that means to your own story. And also the, the relationships um, our own soldiers have with, with their allies. Because we always think of it as, as competition and, and sometimes violent competition. Um, but it's, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that there's a lot of uh, friendly mutual cooperation among people who want to see the war get won and are happy uh, to do all they can to support each other to make that happen. And I can think of no better place, and Bob, you know this already, than between 1st Canadian Division, 1st U.S. Division, and the Sicily campaign. So it's coming, Bob. Ubeek. Um. Lee, let's go back into the battle itself, but from a historian's perspective, let's talk about sources. Um, of course, you know, Terry, Terry is, is the, the leader amongst us of telling us to, um, you know, see the battlegrounds um, and use the battlefields as a source. Um, but a question from Spencer Paddock, he's coming from Winnipeg, um, is eventually going to make his way to Fredericton. Uh, his question is on sources, and he wonders what sort of sources, because we've talked about the battlefield already, um, what, what is kind of the nature of primary sources in this situation um, as, you know, soldiers make their way um, to Caen and then south of Caen? What does that primary batch of primary sources look like? And, and maybe, maybe even beyond, you know, written primary sources, whether there's some more kind of archaeological on the ground stuff that we can use as well. 
Spencer, I don't know if you heard your, you felt your ears burning earlier today, but I was having a, I met up with Matt Sears. We're co-supervising Spencer's thesis when he comes to UMB next fall. This really is old home week tonight. Um, it's, a, it's a good question, Spencer. Uh, we're, one of the reasons that we use these events as uh, tools for Canadian teachers is because they are so source rich and because so many of the sources are available in the digital common and more of them are becoming so by the day. Uh, and the amount of paper, the amount of ink spent documenting so much, so many different kinds of activity in the Canadian Army in the Second World War is enormous. And new, new sources are being tapped and investigated on a routine basis that haven't been cracked yet. Uh, but in the case of operational history, a lot of, there, there's not as many people living in the operational world anymore, but Rob Engen's done some really powerful stuff looking at morale uh, in, the, in the charge reports and the censorship reports and the, uh, uh, the questionnaires done for infantry officers. If you're not familiar with his work already, very, really interesting guy, uh, good guy. He's been, he's a, a, one of our tour alumni, came with us to Sicily on our Canadian Army uh, Greg Center Combat Training Center staff ride in 2012, I think it was, um, and was, was a powerful member of that group. Um, in amongst, for me, one of, the, uh, one of the important key sources that Terry introduced me to are the radio logs but the radio logs that track every message sent uh, between battalions to brigade headquarters and back down the pipe and between subunits and supporting arms. These are richly detailed, but dense. There's so much of it to go through, so many grid map references to check against the maps. And it makes it, the, the work of doing it takes an extraordinary amount of time. And that's probably, it probably turns a lot of people off of doing it. But when you do it, you can discover important new things. If people decide that writing about how a battle unfolds is relevant. And one of the things that I'm asking myself right now is, is that relevant? Uh, I think it might be, again, I, I, I had fallen away from that for a while after uh, coming back from Afghanistan. I'm wondering if, if we were, if I was asking the right questions about the past, but uh, I've come to rethink that and, and think about uh, tactical problems that soldiers have to solve within an operational and strategic context and the way they navigate the system and interact with their higher chain of command and negotiate their orders. The process of doing that is really uh, reflective of a whole range of ways that Canadian citizens uh, who have different levels of power in their communities navigate living through different experiences in Canada today and through the events that we go through and interact with the levels of government above them. So maybe these, maybe these events are relevant uh, still, and, but certainly the sources are rich. And the sources about the kinds of issues that you're interested in, Spencer, of uh, uh, psychological impact among soldiers is, is tremendously rich. So I'm not trying to woo you away from the classics world. Sorry, Matt, if you're listening, his other co-supervisor, who's our class assistant, uh, expert in classical warfare at the Greg Center. But if you ever want to come to the Second World War side and tackle questions related to the psychological impact of, of veterans, then we got socks full of sources that you can uh, use to track those questions. Speaking, get, getting now into historiography, Lee, um, Alex uh, Fitzgerald Black, he's our, our next speaker coming up. He's got a number of questions. This is not actually Alex's question, but I remember in his, uh, um, in, in his, uh, his abstract for his talk in two weeks, uh, he mentions George, George Blackburn's The Guns of Normandy. Um, and this question comes from Paul Lagis. Um, sorry if I got that wrong, Paul, um, your last name, but I'm, he, he asks um, what impact Blackburn's book had on um, kind of Canadians' understanding of, uh, of the, the advance towards fillets and Canadians' role there? Oh, I remember when I was doing my PhD work, I'd see George in, in the archives. You'd see him in there every day, beavering away. It's, a, it's one of those examples of the story of a, of a veteran who had a, a, a powerful experience as a mid-grade leader uh, and, and gunners have a wonderful ability to see the story. I, I always um, was impressed by how gunners make the best UAV pilots um, because they have that way of seeing the battlefield in a three-dimensional way and imagining things 
in the big picture and the micro picture at the same time, because they need to be able to do that in order to you know, operate their, their to, deli to deliver their shells on the target from their ordnance. Um, and so George had that, that gunner's perspective of the battle that he then grafted to that interest in, in reading in on the, on the literature and contributing to the debate around that. It was after and around the time that Terry was working at changing the paradigm. So I, I would argue that it became part of the effort by adding particularly uh, to that understanding of the sophistication of the way artillery fire was applied in order to destroy the counterattacks, in order to suppress the enemy on the approach. Uh, George, George added a, a tremendous amount of depth to the way we understand how that worked right up to the end, you know, and, and especially the, the, the part of George's work that impressed me the most of all was uh, when Terry and, and myself and the rest of the group, and we'd go up to Jeff and Evert and, and Mike and Andrew Arochi and Jim Wood, Jesus, the whole rack of us would uh, go up to the Netherlands too and uh, <clears throat> think about how that system of applying massive coordinated fire had to be altered in the, in the Netherlands campaign at the end of the war. And uh, George's way of, of demonstrating how that made a, a unique challenge in the Netherlands made a tremendous impact on me uh, and my thinking about the nature of the war and what was so unique about it in the last month. And that, that has grown something Mark, uh, we've all worked on together to create a, a Netherlands-specific teachers program uh, with the help of a, of a Dutch resistance veteran um, and his wife, John and Lucinda Flemmer, John's past now, uh, to make a unique teachers program in the Netherlands to focus on that. But yeah, George was a tremendous addition uh, by having something more than a series of memoirs that uh, lended weight to the counter narrative. Good, good question, good, good observation. I've got a, a technical question for you, Lee, coming uh, from Joel Watson. He's in, uh, no, I don't think he's in Ottawa. I can't remember. He's where south he's of Ottawa. <laughs> um, he, he just asked if you could explain some more about the role of platoon commanders and troop leaders uh, and what, they're, what they were required to do at Normandy. Oh, well, I don't think it's changed too much since uh, the way platoon and troop leaders work today. Um, and uh, I guess it's, it's, uh, it's the place that I remain um, most interested in, uh, in part because it takes arguably a fair long time to create a good platoon leader. Um, and <laughs> this is a leading question, Joel. It takes a long time and a good system. And there's been some great work done, obviously, and th this is this really the question speaks to some of the important new work and new questions that goes back to Spencer's issue about sources. Jeff Hayes's work on how junior officers get spit out of the machine uh, is obviously pretty powerful. Um, and I hope he'll speak a little bit about that in his webinar and his uh, part in this webinar series to close it out. Um, Andy Brown's new work on the creation of the NCO Corps is equally good for shedding light on how the sophisticated system evolves to, to produce good platoon leaders who can work well with their platoon second-in-commands or platoon sergeants uh, to tactically lead their platoons in the fight and coordinate the enablers and synchronize the enablers. And by enablers, I mean the tanks and the guns. Uh, this isn't just the officer drawing his revolver and blowing the whistle and saying, follow me. The, the, the platoon commander has to be able to run a, a micro all arms team. And that's, that's really a, it's something that had been evolving since the, since the first world war, but it really came into its own in the second. And one of the issues that's, that's on my plate right now, working on a, a chapter with another student of mine, uh, looks at how young, the junior leaders, platoon commanders in particular, but also their, their NCOs uh, came to be in the positions that they're in at the time of combat in Italy in 1943 and 44. And what we're finding is that the, there's a tremendous amount of militia experience, 1930s militia experience spread around the army, confirms Andy Brown's findings. Uh, but, but we're looking at the, the Eastern Third Brigade with the Carlton York Regiment and the West Nova Scotia Regiment in particular. And so many of the officers at, right up to the end of the war at least get some preliminary exposure to military service in the militia first. So they've got a slow build process. 
And of course, Milton Gregg, the namesake of the Gregg Center for the Study of War and Society, is a tremendously influential person in the development of those leaders. Jeff's done some wonderful work on Milton Gregg in his leadership development training role in out in Vernon, BC, in Brockville, um, Ontario. First Brockville, then Vernon. And uh, Joel's also working on Milton Gregg for his own thesis and, and, and bringing out the story of that one particular person involved in the training system. But there's lots of other influential cats uh, in this process. And I think it challenges the old narrative that the Canadian Army in the Second World War only got good after it cleaned out the First World War dead weight. I think more and more, th those of us who are working in this field are proving that that's, we can call it bullshit on that. Uh, that yeah, sure, there may be people who are too old to take their troops into the field, but there are a heck of a lot of people who've got knowledge and expertise and energy to give to the training system to prepare the young officers to be able to do their incredibly demanding and sophisticated jobs to lead a platoon and be able to coordinate the actions of what's supposed to be 33 riflemen, which was seldom more than 20, and at times take over the company, at times be the company 2IC, uh, and, and always synchronize with the tanks and the guns and the engineers and the, all the combat service support troops too. It's a, it's a big management executive job that can't be done without the, the platoon sergeants. So these, these young officers are, are extraordinary humans. And Joel knows this better than anybody because he works in the veterans transition world. The experience that the ones who come home alive with at managing teams of teams in really difficult, extraordinary circumstances is powerful. And a lot of those young officers, when they come home, uh, once they get healthy again, Joel himself has come up with countless examples of how many of these people become talented leaders in their communities as mayors, as businessmen, uh, as, as Kiwanis Club uh, executive members, um, doing extraordinary things to build the Canada that we live in now. So, uh, Platoon commanders of the world, unite. And troop leaders too, for us Tycos, dashing young cavalry officers. Lee, why don't we just do uh, one final question because we are we are coming up on the two hour mark and I think, um, I'm sure everybody is melting like I are right now um, and need to find some air conditioning if they aren't in it right now. Um, I wanna, a number of people have, um, really, I guess they appreciated your comment about how our, how we have treated the war dead in the world wars in the 20th century can help us, um, you know, think through um, how we might commemorate, remember, and repatriate Indigenous children's remains. Um, I'm wondering if you could, what, I guess, what sort of things in particular do you think are relevant in that conversation? Which, which things do you think are, are, are useful in us talking about how we might do these actions of reconciliation? Um, I've been talking extensively with, uh, our, with uh, my Greg Center colleagues about this of late as because we're launching on this new study of the indigenous experience in the Great War. Um, first of all, I think we have to be very careful not to come in with a, uh, a settler perspective that we have expertise to give to them and, and, and to tell them how to do it. Um, that the first, that we, there, there might be a pattern, there might, we might have good sources and evidence and, and plans about how to do this, but ultimately this is gonna require community engagement uh, with Indigenous communities who may all have different wishes about how they want and need to do it for their communities. And it has to be led by them. And if they decide they want to draw on the way this has been done in other instances, then we can cross that bridge when we come to it. But by God, if there's anything I think we've all, we are, have learned, Christ, we're just starting to learn. It's that uh, this is not our solution to impose on anyone uh, we have to ask and listen, and uh, and and if asked for assistance, offer it. Some wise words to end, Lee. Um, 
thank you very much for your time. Uh, we really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. Um, two hours in that uh, humid basement of the Greg Center. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, I guess looking forward at our next event, it will take place in two weeks um, from tonight on the 14th of July, same time, 7.30 p.m. Eastern time. Um, as we mentioned, it will feature Alexander Fitzgerald Black of the Juno Beach Center. Um, and his talk will examine the impact of air support on soldiers morale at the Battle of Normandy. Some people may be under the impression that because you've registered for one event, you will have registered for all. Um, that is not the case. You actually have to register for each and every webinar. Um, so if you haven't done that, please go to our website, canadianmilitaryhistory.ca forward slash webinar to register for as many of these events as you can, hopefully, you come to all of them because we love to have you. We love to have you on board with us. Um, remember again, Lee's books are available. You can look at the at the bottom of your screen in the chat function. I'll make sure to keep the webinar on for a little bit longer for those who do want to um, copy that link over and um, copy the discount code so they can get their um, free shipping option. Um, other than that, I want to thank everyone for attending tonight, for getting through this this awful heat. We're all in it together. Um, try to stay cool. And uh, in the meantime, you know, stay safe, stay cool, as I said, and uh, have a great night, everyone. We'll see you in two weeks. Thanks again, Lee. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. And good luck, Fighter Bar. <laughs>